My name is Monk Rowe. I'm very happy to have Michael Weiss here today, composer, pianist, and educator. And I'm going to backtrack to about 15 seconds ago. And you said Art Farmer used to call you Weiss because of his uh, time on, uh, across the pond. And in, in that one statement, I'm like, uh, I'm jealous because Art Farmer never had, you know, I was never with him and have the opportunity where he could mispronounce my name. So congratulations <laughs> on that. You're very welcome. Thank you. This is a broad <laughs> question. Um, you moved to New York in, in the, in the eighties. Is that correct? Well, uh, the very end of 1981, Okay. by uh, January of 1982, I had an apartment and I was in, so I'm about reaching my 40th, anniversary as a New Yorker. If we can ignore the uh, the COVID time for a moment, can you compare the way you made a living back then in the, in the 80s and what you're doing now? And does it reflect New York as a jazz scene? There were a lot more gigs, to put it simply, there were a lot more gigs to be had uh, for piano players uh, in New York in the 80s and the 90s because uh, I guess more, well, there were a lot of clubs, but there were also restaurants that had jazz and had very good jazz pianists and had good pianos. Uh, and uh, I don't know, there seemed to be a, a lot more to do overall. And why the change? Uh, well, just fewer, fewer clubs, fewer, fewer uh, restaurants having jazz. Uh, I don't, I don't know the reason. Do you think there, jazz? I, you know, is jazz a hard sell these days more than? Um, than it used to be. It's never, it's been a long time since it was sort of the pop popular music of the day. But I wonder as time goes by, if people's attention span and their listening habits make it harder to sort of sell jazz. I think it's, a, I think it's live music of all kinds have been affected across the board from, from the top down from from the most popular <clears throat> pop stars you know down to uh you know the uh the uh the the, the semi-professional or, or a semi-amateur uh solo folk guitarist i think it's live live music has been affected across the board uh and i don't know <clears throat> if it's if it just has to do with uh advances in technology, the internet. Um, but I, but I mean, I think of in the, in the eighties, even uh, Madison square garden, giant stadium, pop stars would fill, you know, Billy Joel, uh, Bruce Springsteen, Madonna, who Prince, mm -hmm. Michael Jackson, whoever <clears throat> would fill, 50,000 seat stadiums regularly. And I don't think that exists for them anymore either. Okay. When you were a kid growing up, um, I read that you started with classical piano lessons, but that you took to starting to pick out popular tunes. Um, and when they said you picked them out, what was that process like for you? Did, and did you have a sort of an aha moment that you can remember where you said, oh, this is how music works, or I'm able to do this. This is how songs are put together. Well, I think uh, from the time I started piano lessons around the age of six, I think I probably realized that I had perfect pitch and that I could 
hear music and know and go to the piano and and know what the notes were. Um, I uh, my earliest musical memories are the Beatles and all mid '60s pop music. And I remember going to the piano and trying to figure some of those songs out by ear. Um, and in my, in my early teens, I started to have a little garage rock bands. I got an organ, a Farfisa organ, and I played that. Um, my, my aha moments came later. Okay, before we get to those, which I definitely want to, I'm, I'm wondering at what point when you were playing, you know, the Farfisa, did you realize that these chords that you were playing had actual names and the symbols for them and that oftentimes one led to another? Mm. I don't, I really have no recollection of when I became aware of chord symbols. I'm sure I, I understood major and minor and, and dominant seventh chords uh, because I was recognizing and addressing that in, in the classical music I was playing and the pop music I was playing. But uh, I had an innate understanding of those things, but I really don't remember the first time that I I saw or wrote down chord symbols. Probably, maybe not until uh, I was aware of jazz. Mm -hmm. And was one of your aha moments becoming aware of jazz, and how did that occur? That was that was the first one. Uh, when I was fifteen, my piano teacher suggested that I attend the Interlochen music camp in Michigan. This was 1973. And up to that point, I, I didn't know a thing about jazz. I might have, I could have heard of the name Louis Armstrong, but I don't remember. Nothing, zero. Uh, and what was great about uh, that music camp, I remember getting a some paperwork in the mail uh, and a selection of courses, just like uh, registering for college. Uh, at, at 11 a.m., you can take this, you can take that, you can take that. And here's something called jazz improvisation. I don't know what that is. Let's see what that is. Uh, but uh, early in the, in the term of the camp, the faculty jazz quintet performed a concert and that was really my first exposure to jazz and i remember they played it was a relatively new release on cti they played straight life of freddie hubbard mm -hmm. and it just blew me away and immediately without hesitation that's in, in, however i formulated the thought in my mind I would translate that now as this is your life mission right here, right now. So, so uh, intellectually, spiritually, every kind of way, my mind was ready for this more advanced music. And I, and I grabbed onto it instantly. And to give you the, the, the degree of that within six weeks or so I had written a big band arrangement and I, I, I thank will forever be grateful to Dave Sporny who ran the jazz program there at that time and laid out the harmonic theory and the ins and outs of, of everything about jazz pedagogy and I soaked it up like a sponge incidentally I had a chance to hear Duke Ellington and his orchestra, who came through, uh, as well as the Stan Kenton Band, which had a very young Interlochen alumnus, Peter Erskine, at the drums. When I came, when I started high school that fall, 
in Dallas, Texas, there was a, it's like a career development type of uh, early edition of a magnet high school. So under that roof, I had four hours of music a day, every day, every school day that included an hour of big band rehearsal. So anything I wanted to write, I could get played, you know, the next morning. All I had to do is stay up all night to copy the parts, which I did quite a bit to the detriment of my first period English class. But uh, that was it. I was on my way. Well, you had that in, uh, in common with Duke Ellington. I mean, there's nothing like that instant uh, gratification or in information that you gain from that. Um, how did you learn about voicings and ranges and what to do and what not to do? Just from trial and error? Well, I, I got that, that very practical early training from, from Dave Sporney. You know, it was the first time I, I saw how a, a trombone worked how it, what a trumpet did, the range, the transpositions, uh, all the different ways to, to harmonize a, a melody, four part, five part harmony, uh, double the lead, passing diminished chords, all this type of stuff he laid out so clearly. Um, fortunately, uh, at that time, as you might recall, uh, Kendor Music Publishing was publishing a lot of Thad Jones music, which was great. It was like the greatest thing that could have happened to jazz education at the time was for big bands to play Thad Jones's music. And so that was one of the my first big influences. Um, and just, yeah, trial and error, just trying to apply you know, I didn't really study his scores uh, per se, but uh, what I was hearing in the band uh, and my understanding of th theoretical ideas about moving harmony and so forth, I was trying a lot of things out, yeah. Yeah, we just played Groove Merchant here about 10 days ago <laughs> from, from Thad's Sure. Book. Well, everything kind of came full circle because once I was in New York, I began subbing on the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, first with Mel and then after Mel. And then, even though I wasn't a, a, an official member of the band, I probably played more gigs as the pianist of the band than any other pianist in the history of the... I think I played over 700 gigs with the band. Wow. Something or 600, something crazy. But all to say that, you know, as, an, as a professional musician, I was able to sit in, inside the band uh, night after night, uh, and Thad's genius just never, never becomes tiresome. It's 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 wonderful. And uh, I became good friends with Roland Hanna, and and uh, interacted professionally with a number of other uh, alumni of the band. So I was going to save this question for later, but you're talking about. Um early on learning how to voice horns. Um, I wonder if that experience translated to the way you comp at the piano, that your hands may be cre recreating or have in mind how you voiced those horns. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, what an arranger does in a big band is orchestrated accompaniment and at the piano is is improvised accompaniment but but they should be just as good they should both be as good as possible uh and what i found is that not to get too technical here uh, but uh, a good voicing a good spacing of of chord tones and intervals over whatever given range you're working with. A good voicing is, is good on the piano as it, it just as good as it is with, with horns. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, 
what Thad might write for eight brass, four trombones and four trumpets, uh, would sound great on the piano. So yeah, there's, uh, I think that all the types of considerations, range, where you put certain chord tones, how you voice things, uh, I apply equally to the piano as I do to uh, horns. Before the, the days of finale and those programs where you can hear your work back if you choose, this is not a question, just an observation, because I've done quite a bit of it myself, and there was nothing like that feeling of spending all this time writing a chart copying the parts, and that first time it gets played back to you, which can be a joy or perhaps not. Well, it's, uh, it's the truth, right? <laughs> it's, it's right, it's right there. Uh, hopefully you have the sensitivity and the understanding to know if something works well or not as well as you thought. You know, it's how you process that information is, is just as important <laughs> as experiencing it. <clears throat> yeah, and if you haven't done it well, you have to be careful not to blame the players. Like, that's not supposed to sound that way. What are you doing? Well, sometimes that is an issue. You know, I like I'm, I'm very detail oriented. I'm very specific uh, the way I perceive of a melody the way I conceive of a melody, for example, or the phrasing of, of any, any phrase, the, the articulation of a phrase, the way I would play it on the piano, the way I conceive it is how I want it. And, and when you notate something for uh, another musician, a horn player, for example, uh, if you're going to, put articulation markings, they must be observed. <laughs> you don't want them to be ignored. But <clears throat> there's there's so many subtleties that really can't be notated, written down that well. And uh, learning something by ear <clears throat> is obviously the best and the purest way to understand a composer's intent. And uh, there's no better example than, than Monk. When you listen to the way Charlie Rouse, uh, for example, plays Monk's melodies with him, he plays them, well, first of all, Monk plays the melody with the saxophonist most of the time. So the, the saxophonist has to listen to how Monk is phrasing his melodies, which notes are short, which notes are long, which note gets the accent, which notes are legato, which notes are not legato. Uh, but I don't know for a fact, but I would, I would be sure that, that uh, I would guess that, that Rouse learned Monk's tunes from Monk by ear. I know Johnny Griffin told me that he never saw any music of Monk's, that he actually had to learn the songs for the first time on the bandstand at the five spot and monk would just play the melody over and over again until he got it <clears throat> but once he got it it was as pure as 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 monk's intent could be because there is no other type of interpretation here it is copy that i got a little <laughs> flash last night i was listening um one of your performances that's on youtube and Walt Weisskopf was playing, and I, I think it was um, <clears throat> Soul Journey. And he played the melody, especially in the beginning, so pure, like devoid of uh, excess vibrato. Every note was hit right on the head. And as a saxophone player, I was thinking to myself, I wonder if you wanted that kind of purity from him, and did he know it, or did you instruct him, or maybe it just happened? I think he, he, he read the music 
verbatim and there was nothing I needed to say. There weren't any adjustments needed. So it was what I wanted. It's very, it's a very orchestrated melody. Uh, it's, it's, it's not the kind of melody that you, that you interpret like a standard that you, that you change a rhythm or change a note mm -hmm. because that's what you feel on that particular day. Uh, it's pretty cut and dry. I'm not one who makes too much out of titles and their relationship to the actual music, but it seemed an effective way to start that piece because it left a lot of room for where to go with it. Okay. <laughs> where do your titles come from? Uh, well, they come last. Okay. You know, I, sometimes I joke about, uh, you know, the, the fan that comes up to you after the set and says, uh, boy, it must be so great to, to make music. When you're feeling sad, do you want to write a sad song? It's like, no, when I'm sad, I want to watch veg out in front of the television and crack open a beer or, <laughs> you know, uh, the mood that you're in is, is not what you, you know, what you're, what you go, what you, what you are in when you compose, you know, when you compose, you're in a certain frame of mind and you, and, and you draw on your experience of various emotions and things that you want to communicate. Uh, you don't have to necessarily be in that frame of mind when you are composing, obviously. So, uh, so the, to answer the question, the, the last thing I think about usually is a title. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's purely a musical, uh, uh, experience or expression. It's, it's after that is complete. Then, then you can go back and say, okay, well, what does this, what's the mood of this piece? What is it? What does it evoke? What does it make you think of when you listen to it? And that's when you start to think about a title. That's when I start to think about a title. I, I love this topic uh, because I've always been fascinated with many times you see writers who define improvising in jazz and improvisers are playing what they feel. They're expressing themselves. Um, and I may be misreading their intentions, but I always get the impression that they think jazz musicians are expressing their innermost feelings whenever they're improvising. And I wonder how you feel about that. What is the role of emotion when you're, if you're playing a bop tune at 180 beats per minute, how much emotion can your improvising express? Well, in, 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 in the language, there's, there's, uh, there's always a, an emotional component. There should be an emotional component. How, uh, the, just like when you have, it's, 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 there's so many great, uh, analogies to human speech, to verbal communication sentence structure, uh, to storytelling. And, uh, and a good storyteller will emphasize a certain word in a sentence or will pause between phrases or clauses for a certain effect, for a certain intent. Uh, will accent a certain syllable to get their point across in a, in, a, in a more communicative, more direct, more emotional type of way. Uh, so I think all that applies to music. 
Um, there, there's so many different parameters. You know, it's uh, it's not only rhythm. It's not only melody. It's not only one dynamic. It's not only short notes. It's not only long notes. Every one of these components uh, become part of your your story. Sometimes your idea is rhythmic, rhythmically based. Sometimes it's melodically based. Sometimes you play a very short declamatory phrase, and then you follow that with a long, more uh, a longer, more melodious phrase. Um, I yeah, I think there there must be some type of emotional content in in what you play. If it's entirely an intellectual exercise, then, you know, everyone can, can do what they want. You know, everyone, everyone has their own idea of what's of good taste. And, uh, you know, this music is here for everybody to do whatever they want with. So, so what one person says is good or bad or should be or should not be, who, who am I to tell someone what to do or what's good or what's bad for them? You know? right. Well said. When you moved to uh, New York in the early 80s, were you a goal type person? Had you laid out a plan for what you hoped would happen no, I'm 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 a little too uh, disorganized for that. <laughs> to, I mean, uh, to to have this sort of I uh, pretty much a more spontaneous type of person. However, I did know that I wanted to play. I got the most gratification from playing with you know great players, players that I admired, players that I I looked up to. Uh, I aspired to play with the players that I used to listen to on records that were in New York. Uh, I got great satisfaction out of being able to, to be on the bandstand and to be making music with uh, my, my idols. Um, and that was the type of career path that I, I guess I wanted to have. I wanted to come up through the ranks so to speak, because that's, that was, that was what I saw through my, all my recordings, side men who, who gained more and more appearances on recordings and, and became leaders in their own right, uh, who established a, a track record, uh, credentials, professional credentials. And I thought that's, that's the way I, I want my career to progress. I, I see a collection of LPs behind you, and I know I used to spend many hours reading uh, liner notes, and and almost like keeping track of. You know how many LPs does Clark Terry show up on, and and that kind of thing. And I, I wondered if you did that, and did you envision someday seeing your name. No, I, I didn't really think like that. Um, I, I'm I'm not. I have a lot of records here, but I'm not really a real record collector. I'm not a completist. You know, I have a lot of Jackie McLean records, but I don't have them all. I have a lot of records of various particular artists, but there's some that I don't have that that maybe a lot of people have in their collections. It's just just didn't get around to it. Um, I never really, th I just, I never really thought of like, okay, one day I'm going to have a hit record. I, I'm going to do everything I can to be a blue note recording artist. Um, I was just happy playing with, with, with great players and, and being able to tour with them. That was a sort of a mark of arrival, uh, a, a confirmation that I'm doing what I set out to do. You've played with a long list of um, 
really accomplished saxophonists in particular. And I wondered if we started with Johnny Griffin, did he tell you what he wanted if he wasn't getting it? Or did he pretty much let you do your thing? Uh, in, in all those years, uh, he never gave any specific instruction. He never said, do more of this, do less of that. Uh, so I have to assume that he was happy with how I was playing and how the rhythm section was playing. Um, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't really analytical in that kind of way. I mean, you could, the way he played, you had to, you, you understood what's the best type of accompaniment for him. It's different from other soloists, you know, he's, uh, very exuberant and, and effusive and and bu bubbling. He's like a, a a bottle of champagne that has a lot of bubbles. So he's bubbling all over the place. So you just have to you have to let that happen. You know, the the there's a yin and yang of of uh, soloists and accompanists. There's only so much room in the bar for notes. So the busier somebody plays, a soloist plays, the less busy the accompanist plays. And the more sparse a soloist plays, the busier the accompanist can play. You know, uh, you know, uh, Miles Davis's rhythm sections, let's say uh, with Wynn Kelly, and let's say with Herbie Hancock, could never have done what they did if Miles didn't give them the space to do it. You know, it's, it's, it's a two-way street there. Um, so, so getting back to Griff, you know, he was, he had his certain predictabilities and he had a lot of unpredictabilities and you had to manage that and, and, and not get in the way. And, and, and let things happen. <clears throat> Find your spots, pick your spots. Did you have much music on the piano when you played with him? No. Lead sheets, chord charts. No, we pretty much, uh, we learned the repertoire very fast. Um, you know, I can't, I can't recall any gig where I had music on the piano, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, <clears throat> except maybe a record date or something, but not on a gig. Is that a uh, something you try to pass on to mu jazz majors in college? The fact that those years that you played at that level, that you were playing from intuition and memory, I mean, yes, of course. Uh, that's that's the the biggest problem. Probably one of the most fundamental uh, problems with jazz education is a uh, an emphasis on reading music and not using your ear and and not pulling the music away. And but so much of this has to do with uh, the you know the professional experience, you know, there with so fewer opportunities for younger players to work, to play, to perform on a regular basis, to apprentice with established players, uh, to, to have to kind of sink or swim in that, on the bandstand, so to speak. Uh, those skills have just gone away, you know. If there were a lot more performing opportunities with a that were still using the Great American Songbook, uh, 
you know, young side men would just have to buckle down and be able to learn and hear songs that they didn't know on the bandstand. Uh, I've experienced that throughout my career. Every time I get on the bandstand with George Coleman, I'm going to learn a new song. Uh, Lou Donaldson. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> like Lou would never announce a song before he plays it. He never counted a song off before he started to play it. He never tapped his foot into a song. He just started playing the melody of the song he wanted to play in tempo, and you were expected to know it. One time he, <laughs> we were playing a, a gig in Connecticut, and he started to play the doo-dee, doo-dee-dee, doo-dee, doo-da, dee doo da and then Jamil Nasser's playing and drummer's playing, and I'm like, I'm frozen. I don't know what that is. And he turned around and he looked at me and said, ah, you don't know that, man. Ah. And I learned it by, by a chorus. I had it. It was the song called You. Sonny Rollins recorded it. But that's how you, that's how you learn. <clears throat> Does it help because you had perfect pitch that you can listen to the bass player and th that's vital, what the bass player is playing, especially if you don't know a tune? Well, you better hope the bass player knows it. What do you yeah. do if he doesn't know it either? <laughs> You're making assumptions there. <laughs> <laughs> really? The bass player sneaking over to look at your left hand and you're going, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So you have to get your, your clues from wherever you can find them. <clears throat> Obviously, the more songs you know, the more, the more ways you know a harmonic progression might likely go or what, what chords a melody is implying. I'm, yeah, by, by the tonality that the melody is in at the moment. You had a statement um, <clears throat> from Jazz Times, and you said the, the 60s and 70s age group was the last of the truth. And I'm assuming you're talking about some of the people like Johnny Griff Griffin you played with and I'm wondering what you meant by the last of the truth. Well, it was probably a long time ago that it I said It was quite a that. while back, and you were, you were also <laughs> commenting on the public's exposure to meteor, mediocre talent. It, I think it might have been the same article. Well, a lot of things have changed since then. Uh, my, my outlook, the way I think about things, has probably changed since then. But, um, yeah, first, you know, the, the, I think of the, the players who, who established themselves uh, in, in various heydays of, of, of the development of this music as, as the truth, because it's, it's, it's unfiltered. It's, it's, you know, from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And successive mm -hmm. younger, younger generations, uh, you know, are, are reinterpreting and, and uh, it's, it's just another filtration system that's going on. And uh, there's, Sometimes, sometimes yes, sometimes not. And again, everything comes down to one's own idea of, of good taste. But but uh, a certain authenticity, a certain way of of delivering this <clears throat> this language is represented by those players. Uh, and you know, as as they pass on. Um, what people now think of what jazz is, is, is left to, you know, these later generations of, uh, of, of how, 
how people play these days. And I, I think uh, there's so much, uh, there's so many components to, to the language of jazz that have developed over the years, over, you know, almost 100 years now, um, that go through a, a, a lot of different transformations. And um, I think that's what I was trying to express when I said that. The stylistic changes in that 100 years are um, quite amazing and I'm wondering if it becomes harder and harder to be innovative and still create music that is listenable and appealing. Uh, you know, it's 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 all up to the to the music maker what what choices they make. You know, I mean, I, when I were talking about what you were asking me about before, uh, Last of the Truth, I think what came to mind is like the way Frank West plays a phrase on his horn. Uh, he's expressing his life experience. Uh, my experience and, and, and someone in their 30s or in their 20s can't possibly have that experience to be able to express that way on their horn. What, what he heard, what he grew up with, what's, what's in his, his DNA. <clears throat> uh, that's, that's what I'm talking about. And, you know, to be able to play with somebody like that firsthand and, and experience that is, uh, is priceless. Yeah, I was wondering if you had words for, um, I, I have this little scenario in my head. You're, you're playing a gig with, with Frank West in a club in New York, and it went well. And on the way home... What are you feeling inside after that experience? Uh, I'm well. Look, I'm I'm <clears throat> I'm relatively critical of of my own playing, and I'm probably. less concerned with, with how other people performed on a given night, you know, was my, was I in a good zone? Uh, was everything working well? Did, were my, was my antenna, all my antennas working well? Um, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I'm not quite so analytical that I that I'm that I make a whole study of it. Basically, the gig is over. On to the next. I see. I guess what I was wondering I'm not, about. I'm sure is, what you're getting at. Well, I I um, over the years have been lucky through this project I do to find myself briefly on a bandstand with people like Joe Wilder and of that generation. And I just remember almost like um, I need to pinch myself because here I am and there he is. And I was hoping to do a good job, but I think that I just was um, filled with gratitude that that could happen, that this was happening. Yeah. I mean, look, there's <clears throat> just, just listening. I, I, I worked a fair amount with Joe Wilder and just <clears throat> listening to him play is, is, is so wonderful. 
as, as is with so many of these musicians we're talking about, <clears throat> there's great uh, joy and satisfaction of just just being on the bandstand, regardless of what you do, uh, just listening to what, what comes out of their horn. Um, and, and you, you know, you got a job to do and you, <laughs> you, you do it as well as you can and you, and, and, uh, you, uh, this experience of, of, of this collaborative art form, uh, teaches you how to be in the moment and in the present. And uh, to me, the whole, the whole game that ties everything together is, is the, 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 the cooperation or the, the successful cooperation of your conscious and subconscious. You know what I mean by that? I'd be happy to have you expand on that. You know, when you when you're in the musical moment, when you're in the act of of <clears throat> a creative improv improvised endeavor, <clears throat> uh, you uh, you have to have all your faculties working at, at, at top, you know, at a top level. <clears throat> but uh, when you're improvising, when you're soloing, for example, uh, you you have to get out of the way of of your creativity, and that means. Letting it, you know, there are all types of phrases we say, let it happen, get out of the way. Uh, having a flow, a creative flow, all that is letting your, you know, all your storehouse of ideas that you improvise, that come out, the story you tell spontaneously uh, originates from your subconscious. Your subconscious is all the things you know. And you can't you can't be able to say everything that you know all at once because they, not everything comes to you all at once. So where is it? It's in your it's in your storehouse. Your 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 history of experience. I, I think of is the, is sitting in your subconscious like that's a that's like a vessel where all these ideas and experiences reside. And when you're improvising <clears throat> you're trying to get these ideas to to bubble up to the surface to come out and to have in a, in, a, in a in a beautiful uninterrupted flow uh, and there in the conscious mind there there are a number of Im impediments that 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 impede that creative flow it can be distractions it can be the piano's out of tune. It could be the person's talking too loud next to you. The drummer's too loud. <clears throat> There's a note sticking on the piano. The light is too bright. Uh, you have a stomach ache. A any number of distractions. Sometimes when you're playing, you, f you feel like you don't have any ideas at all. And you're just sitting there going through the motions. The, the fingers are leading you. And you're hoping that the fingers will lead you to some place that spark an idea that you can actually actively, that you can activate a, a little catalyst. <clears throat> but at the moment, there's no catalyst. You are uninspired. What do you do to inspire yourself, to, to jumpstart your creative flow? So to me, uh, this is like the the battle that goes on every time, every single time I'm on the bandstand. What's going to come out? Uh, how inspired will I be? What? <clears throat> how how freely will my ideas flow? Because there's so much, you know. What do you? Th what could you know? 
what comes out in, in any given moment, like maybe a thousandth of what you could do, <clears throat> a hundredth of, of your, you know, how would you rate a, a given gig or a given song or a given solo in terms of your potential? What's a good night? What's a good solo? Well, I think I reached maybe 15% of my potential. That was really good. Or, or man, I think I, I, I got up to 25, maybe 30% of my potential. Things are really, you know what I'm trying to say here? Uh, so to me, it's, it's that battle between, it's like trying to get that subconscious mind to, to just release, <laughs> release its storehouse of, of what you know, what you can do, of, of, of given various catalysts. Sometimes I'll, uh, there are certain tricks I'll do sometimes to try and push myself into having to force uh, a different type of creative situation. Like sometimes I'll, <clears throat> rather than continuing where, where I've gone a million times before, I'll, I'll look at another range of the piano. I'll say, I'm gonna make myself start my phrase up here. Not because I hear it, but just to make myself do it. And then what does that make me do? Uh, sometimes you have to trick yourself to, to, to put to, you know, accidents or how, or how things get going. You have to create an accident. You have to almost some, maybe you have to deliberately hit a note that you don't, you wouldn't hear necessarily. You wouldn't normally go there, but that opens up a, a whole process of, of, You know, creative possibilities. How do how do I make if 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 you think this is a quote quote unquote wrong note or unintended note? How do you make it right? How do you justify it musically? <clears throat> is there any preparation that you do before the gig that may assist you in getting to that point where you want to be? before you play? Uh, there probably is. <laughs> you know, I haven't been very methodical about that, but um, I'm sure, you know, for example, people who, who meditate regularly have a certain discipline, develop a discipline to put them in a, a certain frame of mind before they do what they have to do. Um, I could probably count on one hand the times when I, I reached like a, a, what seemed like an optimal state of mind when improvising, where almost an out of body experience uh, I think playing every night, I mean, you can't, it's very hard to, to reach those states of mind when you're playing a gig, three gigs a month or, or once a week or something like that. There's no, it's no accident that a John Coltrane developed as he did. Well, first of all, he was a practice alcoholic. Even when the gig was over, he had the horn out. Uh, but playing, there's no experience like playing night after night, five, six nights a week, maybe even playing the same repertoire with the same band on tour uh, to, to get you in that place. Um, I was talking about this recently with Charles McPherson just last week, talking about the you know, mind frame for uh, having a, you know, a, the most desired frame of mind you have when you're when you're trying to improvise and and he said that he saw an interview with Bird where he was 
the bird was asked, so what are you thinking about when you're playing? And, and bird said, I looked out at my fingers and I can't believe that it's me. Dig it. So that's what, that's what I'm talking about. That, that out of mind. I mean, it's happened a few times where I was playing and I could actually like leave my body and stand over my shoulder and watch what I was doing kind of thing. Sometimes I'll, I'll try and get in that frame of mind while I'm playing. I'll look, I'll look somewhere else. I'll look at the wall. I'll look across the room. Just as a way to, uh, to free up my, my mind to, to just be in the zone, so to speak. Do you, do you recall if those rare moments where all that came together were in a trio context or solo piano context? Mm. My reason for asking that is I'm wondering the people that you play with over the years, have you made note of bassists and drummers who are the best helpers for you to enter that comfort zone? Uh, not particularly. I mean, obviously, if, 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 if a drummer is bombastic or a bass player is doing something, if either of them are doing something that's distracting in some kind of way, that's going to be a hindrance. Mm -hmm. but, but nothing really more specific than that. Um, I think what I was talking about really happens like during a, a solo, improvising a solo, mm -hmm. where it's almost like, yeah, out of body experience, where you're just watching it happen. And you're not, you're not you're not standing in the way at all. You know, everything is, you know, you're completely aware of what the chord is, of what the tempo is, of, of all that stuff, but you're not thinking about it at all. I think Bird was also quoted, there was some interview uh, like about what he practices or whatever, like learn it and then forget it. Not forget it that you can't do it anymore, but forget it that it becomes a subconscious. You've mastered it and you don't have to think about it while you do it. You can just do it effortlessly. It becomes uh, deposited in that part of your subconscious that you were talking about. It can come back for you. Yeah. I mean, there's so many analogies uh, like with, with sports. People who do things... Uh, let's say collaborative uh, uh, type of uh, engagements where where you're where you're operating on, on a huge on an ex enormous level of, of craft and expertise but the realization of that 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 business is is spontaneous and purely instinctual mm. you know like like uh, when a when a, 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 a offensive uh, guard or right tackle is 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 let is lined up seconds before the play starts he knows what the play is he knows what his his role is but what happens within a half a second after the snap is a purely spontaneous event anything it's and and <clears throat> and that particular player is is all the players are, are operating entirely on instinct so I, I think there's a lot of correlation uh, with with the improvising jazz musician oh. thanks that's uh, some very valuable insight into that mysterious and uh, rather magical process that that happens in jazz do you have life lessons 
You talked about going on the road and how important that was uh, with mostly people who were older than you. In your observations of them, what kind of things did you learn? Um, one important lesson was how uh, how they were how they could easily let uh, the unpredictabilities or the or or when things like being on the road when when things go wrong when things don't go according to plan how easily they could let those things roll off their back how it didn't it didn't didn't bother them half as much as it was bothering me and that was that was an important lesson to learn why why are we taking a 7 a.m. flight we could the gig is not until nine o'clock at night the flight is only an hour and a half long why are we having to get up to take this flight there's eight flights that day and I'm and I'm bitching and I'm mad and I'm blah 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 and I look at the the band leader it's just they just roll with it so <laughs> whatever and, you know experience road experiences like that like okay Ro shut up <laughs> deal with it you know if it doesn't bother them it shouldn't bother you um, <clears throat> just just uh, yeah professional decorum uh, how how the band leader presented their music to the audience Every, every leader has their own way of communicating with the audience, of presenting their repertoire, uh, of engaging with the audience. Um, all, all different, every, everything, all these types of things, you know, uh, how, how they conducted themselves. As band leaders, as uh, as, as uh, businessmen, as entertainers, uh, all that kind of stuff. Excellent. Um, I wanted to run a couple names by you. I already, we already talked about Joe Wilder, and maybe you have something you can offer on uh, John Hendrix. Well. Uh, John had uh, had good taste in a lot of things. <laughs> uh, he liked to live well. Um, he was he was a, a complete natural, uh, and he's probably one of the very very few. A vocalist who could improvise a jazz solo on par with any horn player. He really, he really knew the language. He really got it. And uh, when I worked with him, he had four singers. It was like an expanded Lambert Hendricks and Ross type of repertoire, but. Every set included at least two or three songs, just quartet with John in the rhythm section. And that was very, very satisfying and, and enjoyable because it was just like playing a quartet with a tenor saxophonist. Is vocal accompaniment uh, a challenging, um, different sort of playing for you? I don't do it that much. Mm -hmm. I don't actually, I don't have a whole lot of experience like some pianists working with vocalists. Okay. Um, 
but I'd like to think the same criteria are in play, you know, uh, with a with a vocalist singing a ballad or a tenor saxophonist singing a ballad through their horn. How about Marion McPartland? Well, I only had one one personal experience with her and that was being on her show yes i wondered how how that felt for you uh it was uh it was a little challenging because there was no no rehearsal no talk through it was just sit down and the tape is rolling you know uh I think we played maybe two songs together. She played a couple. I played a few. We talked a little bit. And before you knew it, it was over. Wow. She got the good piano. <laughs> All I, I remember there were two pianos, and there was her piano. And the piano I played on had a pretty stiff action. I see. And I was like, damn. <laughs> Well, she was the host. <laughs> she was the host. This has been a, a wonderful conversation. Um, and I want to wrap up with um, something I heard last night of you playing at Smalls, uh, a quartet with Steve Wilson. And I think you were playing a song called Atlantis. Mm -hmm. And I heard... I think this little motif, and I'll I'll try to hum it. Sort of went, ba do de do de do de do da, ba do ba do ba do ba do wa, and uh -huh. it it came up every once in a while, and it struck me like this is your way. Forgive me if I'm making too much out of this, but it sounded like you were doing this with the idea of sort of marking a part in this performance and keeping the audience with you. That's the way it struck me. <clears throat> well, it's, it's just the, it's, it's the pickup bar of the, of the melody. It's the opening line of the song. It's not the mel it's, it's not, it's just the, the pickup line into the melody. It's not the melody. Per se, it's just the opening, yeah. the opening into the melody. Uh, but uh, let's see. I think the way the way the, the 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 form of the piece goes, um, there was a little vamp section. There there was there was the song form, which was open number of choruses for each soloist. And when the soloist is, plays his last chorus, he cues into a, a little vamp section that's four times. It's, uh, and at the end of that, that we use that pickup of the melody, do 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 be do be do da, to Bring in the next soloist. That's what I heard. So it, yeah, I, it, was, yeah, it was used as sort of a, a button, a, 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 the end. They lived happily ever after, you know. Okay. And on to on to the next. Yeah, it's a little marker, okay. a melodic uh, marker. Yeah. yeah, you know, using and reusing your material, uh, repetition or sequencing is a uh, is the hallmark of a good song and if uh, it it can be referred to as a hook or uh, but any I, I talk about this I, I recently did a, a an online composition and arranging master class called getting more out of your tunes uh, where almost any good song has some repetition in it has some sequencing. You can't. You can't just have a one a, a continuous run-on sentence of new material without ever repeating anything. 
because I think the listener will turn off. But if you just repeat something, you can even change it when you repeat it. Uh, um, uh, a variation of some sort, but any type of sequence, uh, a sequence, yeah. sequence, repetition, whatever you call it, <clears throat> when, when, when a, a listener hears something a second time, it's like then they get it so that now they're ready to hear new information. But if you're only giving out new information all the time, then you can't process it. I went to the store. I, I looked at computers. I looked at monitors. Then I went and had a coffee. So you know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. you're ready for something new. Uh, and I think a, a, good, a, a good solo tells a story in a similar kind of way. Um, you can't just have a whole series of non sequiturs. There's a great interview with Pat Metheny I saw recently where he talked about how so many young improvisers today their solos are just made up of non sequiturs. Oh. <laughs> and it's so true. Yes, good observation. Well, this has really been a fascinating conversation, and I uh, congratulate you on your career so far. And um, I hope that uh, you will be thought of as one of those people like when you apprentice with, with Johnny Griffin, that people will be doing that with you. I hope so. Yeah. You know, all, all we need right now is just work. Like I talked about before, we need, the, the jazz musician needs to play. You just can't develop uh, as an artist unless you're able to do it all the time. You know, right. Like there, the, you know, you can another sports analogy. You know, like uh, a, a baseball season is 162 games. That's like f six games a week for six months. So, and and even with that, you know, uh, a great batting average is like three out of ten times you yeah. you get a hit. Imagine if you. If you just play one game a week, what's your average going to be then? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you the best average possible in these times. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Michael. It was great to be with you, Monk. Thanks for having me.